time again, exposing the truth. Welcome to Coffee Time Again, exposing the truth. Dale at the microphone, the show that demonstrates how history repeats itself. He digs into the past, shows what happens and how it is happening now. Follow the path of history to where it goes, then relate it to today to reveal the connections. The culture that forgets its history has no future. A history buff and loves to talk about it, going back as far as ancient Greeks and Egyptians and beyond. So grab your coffee, your chair, and listen to the show. Hope you enjoy. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is Dale. I'm your host of Coffee Time Again, where we expose the truth. And we'll be exposing the truth with Andy Wiley today. And I'm not quite sure how to label her, what she's talking about. I'm going to let her tell us. And, uh, but when I read her bio, I was very intrigued with what she had to say. It's just the one question. Will humans survive? Which I'm thinking, hmm, good question. So anyway, I invited her on the show. She is here to expose the truth. And we will do that now. I will introduce Annie. She can take over and tell us a little bit about herself. Welcome to the show, Hi. Annie. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Ann Riley. I uh, live right now in the Midwest. Uh, I um, wrote this book about um, the human idea that's coming out in November. Uh, and it's about uh, how we have created a new ecosystem that looks just like the physical ecosystem, but works a little bit differently. Um, and I'm excited to talk about it today. All right. I'm excited to have you here. Thank you for, for that. And let's get started with the question. Okay. Do you think humans will survive? You know, it's interesting. I, I don't know um, because... You know, 99.9% .9 of all uh, species have died uh, in the history of the Earth, but humans are a little bit different. I think we have the potential to survive, uh, but we also right now are doing things that, uh, you know, endanger our survival. So I think if we make some changes, yep, we can do it. Uh, but I think we need to understand uh, what those changes are that we need to make uh, so that we can better uh, in ensure our survival. Okay, I get that. I, of course, it came up into my mind, which now I know that's what I'm talking about, it went away, which is not unusual. <laughs> do, you, do you think that we're going to evolve into some of these, to a different species, or will we stay pretty much the way we are now? I, it's a really good question. I think that evolution is always occurring, uh, and I, um, I think we are already evolving in many ways. Um, I think where we are evolving is probably in our unique capability of thinking in our brains, but I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I think all other animals are evolving, you know, uh, different ways, whatever, whatever fits in your environment is how you will evolve. Uh, so uh, right now, because humans have the ability to change their environment, uh, we we can switch how evolution occurs, or or at least blunt some of the effects effects of it. But I do think we're all always evolving. I think what's more interesting is that using uh, with artificial intelligence coming up, we're creating a new way of thinking um, that. Uh, it uh, goes beyond what human capability is. Uh, and that seems more interesting is if AI figures out how to uh, become a relatively uh, independent life form of their own, we will have created a new life form, uh, right. which, which, you know, is, I'm, I've still been thinking about that. I'm not really sure. Yeah, I'm not sure what's, I'm not real sure about AI at all, what's it's going to happen. Is it going to evolve into its own life form? Well, it, it, it to be a life form, you have to do three things. You have to be protected from your environment. Uh, you have to be able to process resources so that you can survive. And you must procreate. You must copy yourself in some way. I think, um, you know, right now, humans, we, we live in both our human ecosystem and the physical ecosystem where we need resources to survive. 
Um, if AI figures out how to protect itself and procreate without needing resources, they'll have created an entirely new life form um, that's not needed, uh, that doesn't need the, 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 the resources you know, to survive. And that's kind of interesting to me. Uh, yeah. If they do that, that's a completely new life form, just like humans are a completely new uh, life form from animals because of our ability to think. Yeah, I uh, was wondering, you know, because Hollywood's got their version of how AI is going to play out and it's going to take over the world. And like in, uh, oh, it was Arnold Schwarzenegger, I can't think, Terminator series. Oh, right. Yeah. Right. Uh, People are still talking about that now, especially since the upswing of AI. So I don't know. Right. AI is going to evolve into being a separate life form or it's going to be just a tool we use to enhance our lives. Right. Well, it it like I said, you you look at the 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 um, definition of what life is mm -hmm. and what something needs to survive, you know, um if AI can do that, uh and you know the thing is, is it would have to be completely sort of mental. It would have to be the ideas, uh, the the um, the ability to continue to communicate. But the way what humans do that's really different from other life forms is humans are able to create information outside their bodies, right? Human life forms or non-human forms can only create babies. And a few can make like nests and and, and, you know, beehives or something, but those are kind of instructed by their DNA. We can take ideas and create books and spaceships and AI. Now, can AI take that and convert it into its own version of its ability to survive beyond itself? I don't know yet. I just don't know. And I, but I do know it's going to evolve and yeah. there's a chance that it may. Actually, it's already evolving since the, you know, people will say AI is new. It's been around for a while. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. But you know, boy, it's certainly powerful. I it, mean, it does things that, you know, would take, I mean, just writing a book now, you know, they, the, when you go to the editor, they're like, did you use AI? You yeah. know, because they, it's just so powerful. Uh, yeah. So, you know, and fast. <laughs> yeah, I haven't learned how to quite use it to my advantage yet on my show notes, but I'm going to be working on it. I, I usually take the month of August off. It's my anniversary month. So oh. you're a real occurrence for me to have somebody in in August. But I'm going to work on it during the month that I'm not going to be doing podcasts. Okay. So anyway, interesting concepts. So AI is strange being. <laughs> it's a, I think it's it's a just a logical evolution of what humans have been doing. It's just uh, evolution is is predictable in some ways, but it's unpredictable because there's so many facets, so many variations that go into what people do. But you know, you look back, humans, we started with you know language and then writing and then you know for a long time you know it was just it was just books and buildings and and you know stage coaches and then all of a sudden when the, the onset of the computer we've had this massive leap where now we are we are doing all kinds of things that we never could have envisioned before i totally agree with you interesting question the next one was do you think humans can coexist uh, I do. Um, and I think that this is the nature that this is the the premise of my book is that that non-humans have been coexisting for billions of years. Um, and, you know, uh, everybody looks at nature as, oh, survival of the fittest and competition. And of course, that's true. Competition is the default survival mechanisms that if you can't if you can't work with other things, you know, you compete to get your resources. But if you look inside your body, there are 300, I'm sorry, there are 35 trillion cells that work together to keep your body alive. That's a lot of collaboration. And they do it with very specific rules. Um, and if we understood those rules and applied them to humans, even though humans are different, we would do a lot better um, in the survival, uh, in our coexistence uh, category. Yeah. You have a survey on your website that I took. 
to look at it. Yes. Went back and took yes. the survey. And it's really interesting, but one of the things that I noticed, one of the questions you had on there, if humans are going to call this, is there one word that you would, one thing you would, something like that, I'm not with mm -hmm. it, that, that would help, and, and I wrote down communication. How do you think about that? I think you hit it, you know, um, spot on. Um, we are the only species that can communicate um, with all the people in our ecosystem. Um, animals can't communicate. I mean, they've diverged over the years. A tiger cannot communicate with an elephant. You know, no. a squirrel can't communicate with a dog because then they would talk out this whole, don't make me run up the tree, you know? Um, but communication is the base, but but it's not just communication. It's understanding uh, that if understanding of how life works. In your body, those 35 trillion cells cooperate. They collaborate together to make your body and all the other cells uh, uh, survive. And that's, if you look at your, um, kind of when you look at the ecosystem, there's sort of a level, a concentric circle that we we can build. So if you start at the middle and or the very core, DNA is at the core of a cell. And that holds all the information a cell needs to survive. A cell, the DNA is then and housed in a cell. And then the cells are housed in organs and the organs make a body and they're all made of cells. Well, the same thing, the, the human ecosystem has the same equivalent structure, but it's based on the human idea. So instead of DNA at the middle, there's ideas, humans, Basically, instead of having to just follow the instructions of their DNA, they have all these ideas and they can choose which ones they follow. And the human is the one who puts those into action, right? So, um, and then humans then can, can join together to make institutions like businesses and churches and book clubs. And, and then together, they're a society. All those humans and all those institutions create the society. But if you look and make an equivalent construction, all the cells work to make sure the body and the cells are okay. If we were humans using the same con construction, we would say we can do whatever we want, maximize our choice, because that's what humans like to do, but we can't harm others or the society. That's the key. If you don't if you can do everything you want but not harm others, you will live in peaceful, peaceful coexistence. And mm -hmm. that's my point of my book is that it shows all those structures you need to do in order to do that. But it's a basically, nobody can argue with that. You, if they say, hey, you want to do what you want, but you just can't hurt anybody and I won't get hurt in return. That seems like a good deal to me. And that's a very logical thing that that's what all non-humans do. Okay, that's very interesting. I uh, hadn't thought of it looking at it that way. 35 trillion cells. That's a lot of cells. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And they all are coordinated by your neural system and your brain. Mm -hmm. Well, and equivalently in our society, what is the coordinating function of a society? It's our government. Governments are the coordinators because somebody has to say, you know, we all have to figure out how to live together. And we're all people. They're made of people, just like the brains are made of cells. But this time, they have to do what's good for the people. Um, if you're a good government, you will do what's good for the people. You will maximize their choice and minimize their harm. And the government, if the government acts that way, there's a much more likely uh, opportunity for peaceful societies in a peaceful world. That's something that I long for, is a peaceful world where we don't have the strife. But we're going to have right. disagreements. And that's OK. You could be. Right. You can disagree without being disagreeable, I believe. So. Right, right. Well, and it's also easier to sort out. If you look at things in terms of, instead of ideologies, if you look at things in terms of harm, you can sort these things out easier. So for instance, even though some of these things are controversial, let's say somebody is gay. You know what? Being gay doesn't hurt anybody else. You might not like it, but it doesn't harm you. So so you should allow gay marriage to occur because it doesn't harm anybody else. It's a personal decision between two people, right? But if you have something like an airplane where you put an airplane up in the air 
and it could crash and hurt people, then, you know, you want to regulate that. So wherever there's a potential for harm, that's where you regulate. If there's no harm, eh, no need to regulate. So that's a really easy way to kind of determine how governments should act. That may be easy, but it's pretty profound. Put that on your wall. <laughs> <laughs> I will, as soon as I get famous. <laughs> well, you're not gonna do it on this show. I'm not that big yet, but I'm getting there. Okay. It's taken me five years to get one at, but that's all right. I uh, find that to be extremely extraordinary, the way you say that. I'm uh, sorry, what was that? I think you, that's extraordinary, what you said. Mm. If it's not gonna harm somebody else, leave it alone. Exactly. Right. And that way, we don't have to worry about this thing called morality because everybody has a different morality. Mm -hmm. When you're working with a government, you look at the base, just the lowest common denominator where everybody can agree. And again, I think this is a place where everybody can agree that, hey, you get to do what you want, but you can't harm me. And I get to do what I want, but I can't harm you. That's pretty basic that we can all agree on. And that's what democracy should be built on. Yeah, I'm reading the, uh, a book that's interpreting the Federalist Papers, and that's kind of what they're saying in the Federalist Papers. Oh, yeah. Um, you know yeah I, I, uh, now we're talking about the Federalist Papers from way back during the Constitution? Yeah, at the time of the Constitution, yeah. So basically, right. Uh, federal papers were written basically to convince New York State to vote for the Constitution when it was done. Right. And Jefferson's saying a few things in there because Jefferson, Madison, and John Jay are the ones that voted. Mm -hmm. And what I've heard so far, that's kind of what they're saying, but in kind of obsolete language. In the way right. They're... Right. Well, I, I do make a point in my book that the U.S. Constitution is probably the closest thing we have to the what the how the ecosystem works. But mm -hmm. they just because, you know, in the 1700s, they didn't know about cells and and DNA and all those things. They were using the best philosophies from John Locke and, Dave, you know, all of those. Um, yeah. and, and they were extraordinary in their leap from. The, the strong men sort of power that we had before. And I think they are fantastic. I just think what we have done today is our rules have gotten a little bit off track, but the goals of the constitution provide for the general welfare. You know, those things are, are really sound and still work today. We just, our rules, our laws don't always follow uh, because they've gotten off the, do no harm concept, but mm -hmm. you know, they were never directly on it. I mean, it's not in the, like, they didn't say, Hey, you can do what you want, but don't hurt anybody. They said, you know, these, like you said, obsolete language, which, which leaves room for people to interpret it different ways. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem. Even with the mm -hmm. translation I'm reading has been interpreted because I've got a copy of the federal papers in the original writing. No. Oh. okay. Yeah. Confusing. It's hard to read. But the point is, I was attempting to make is it is the most perfect document, but they even say themselves, this is an imperfect document. Right, right. And, you know, like everything else, it fit the times, but they also created new that, that times would change. So they created amend, an amendment process yep. that I think it's a little bit hard to use. In fact, one of the, the cases I make in my book is that we need a whole new branch of government called the evaluation branch is what I call it. And that's where we determine whether people comply with the goal of providing for the general welfare and doing those things, the doing no harm part. We mm -hmm. do a good job of with our judicial system of complying with the laws, but the laws don't always comply with the constitution. The actions of government don't always comply with the constitution. And what we need to be able to do is be able to evaluate the coordinating function to say, hey, you know what? This is not doing no harm here. You know, you, you've you got to do something a little bit different. And I, it's a hard thing to create and I need smart people to help figure out, but I think we're missing a piece because if a person violates their oath of office, we don't have a mechanism to see it. No. And we need to be able to do that because complying with the goal is how a body lives. 
if your cells are off doing their own thing and, you know, getting people to, you know, throw a coup over in your body, that's called cancer and it will kill you, you know, but we, we can learn from that, that, you know, there are ways to evaluate again, given the fact that we want people to choose, we want people to think, we want them to be free, but mm -hmm. we don't always, um, we can't do it while harming others. Right. Uh, you know, doing, I'm just so thrilled of having you on the show today. This is great. What Thank is you. the idea sphere? So the idea sphere is the human ecosystem. So remember, we talked about, you know, this whole cell DNA and cells. Well, the mm -hmm. human ecosystem is based on ideas and the idea we, we, um, the, we have an ideas they, and they are completely non-physical right? They're completely, there's synapses in our brain kind of work and join together to create an idea. And then we go, oh, I have an idea. And the sum of all of our ideas is what we call our mind, you know, not our brain, our mind, where we have all the ideas and my ideas are different than yours. My experience creates different ideas in me. And then those, that mind is housed in your body and the body, your human body is amazing because it can implement those ideas. You've got hands and you've got you know, feed and you can, you have a mouth to go talk with people and do all kinds of things. And then, then people can join together in institutions to build even bigger things. And like I said, all those institutions are like the society we, we grow in. So the idea sphere is exactly parallel to the human ecosystem, but at the base, those ideas, here's the problem with humans. We are born with no ideas. We have all of our DNA instructions so we can survive, but that baby that's born has zero ideas, which means the first thing we have to do is educate our child. We got to teach them language. We got to teach them rules about how to live. And once you do that for like a quarter of their average American life, then they can go and you know, participate fully in the, in, in our society, which is just the, and I, the idea sphere is the sum of all the ideas humans have had and all of the things we've created with those ideas. So well, that's I, in a nutshell, the idea sphere. I think that's great. I uh, was thinking that not all my ideas are good. Oh no. And uh, the reason is so in nature, again, there's no ideas in nature, but everything a, 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 a non-human does is tested by the environment. You either do something and you survive or you do something and you die. So if you if after billions of years, the only guys left are survivors, right? So everything right. is kind of good, but humans change the game because we have ideas. We can have good ideas and bad ideas. So it's not the environment doesn't decide which is a good idea. Other people decide what's a good idea or a bad idea. So in the idea sphere, acceptance is the key. If someone accepts your idea, good or bad, and they gonna follow, they are gonna follow you and implement that idea, then that's the that's technically it's not a good idea, but it's the winning idea. And that's why we got early ideas from way back, like religion that started thousands and thousands of years ago, probably as an early way, as an early science to kind of explain the world around them, has evolved into institutions with gods that we can't really see. But you know, that's an idea that's stuck thousands yeah. of years. And we have lots of ideas like that, you know, um, that have stuck for thousands of years. And acceptance wins, not good or bad. Acceptance, I like, acceptance is the key, I think. Right, right. I, I like that philosophy. I think it's a good idea. How'd you come up with the theory? I, oh, I, I oh well, so in 1990, early 90s, I read a book by Michael Rothschild called Bionomics, uh, Economics as an Ecosystem. And it was eye-opening. He basically tried to show that economics paralleled the ecosystem and we could learn our economics would be better if we learned from the ecosystem. Oh, and he gave me so many ideas, but mm -hmm. he concluded that competition was the way things should work. And I'm like, wait, but you talk about collaboration and you talk about coordination and all these things, but you just sort of left them by the wayside. I said to myself, I was like, you know, I think the real thing is that it's not 
it's not just economics that follows um, the, the ecosystem. Humans follow the ecosystem. There's got to be a seamless link between these two. And that's, um, but I kept getting stuck because I couldn't understand how humans who competed and collaborated just like animals did it differently. And I get got stuck for the longest time until I finally understood the, I switched everything on its head and played with those concentric circles and boom, the parallel systems came out and I was like, oh, I get it. They really are the same. We really are just a level up. We just work the same way, but on a different level. Just like if you go back to the universe, there's just matter and energy in the universe. And then life came along and did something different than matter. We're made of matter and energy, but it did something different. It was able to copy itself, produce a new generation. And that was life. Matter couldn't do that. Energy couldn't do that. But somehow those things mixed together on earth and made life. Same thing. We mixed together with ideas and made a new version of life. Okay, that's pretty logical to me anyway. Yeah. Uh, well, I had it had to be logical or I wasn't going to buy it. I had to, it had to fit because yeah. I since I was a kid, I was like, you know what? This has got to fit together. It's got to fit together. I just didn't get it. Since I've been 10 years old, I've been wondering about this. And finally... Mm -hmm. Um, actually, um, Rothschild made one comment in his book. He said, yeah, there's a role for government, but I don't really know what it is. And then I worked on a campaign, uh, a congressional campaign in 2018, and all these people came in to support, you know, like uh, Vice President Biden at the time came in and, you know, Pete Buttigieg came in. All these people came in and I was like, why are all these people coming in to support this one congressional candidate who's... 30, you know, 32 years old. And it turned out that that's when I've understood that coordination, it, the government is the coordinating fact, fun, uh, function and how it, it drives your society. And I was like, oh, everybody wants to be, to direct the, the, the society that. Mm -hmm. And then I went back to this book and it sort of started, started me on the track again. Okay. Yeah. What is the role of government? Well, the government is the coordinating function. The, the Something has to coordinate. I mean, even back in the Declaration of Independence, when Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence, he says, the king has abdicated his responsibility. The king was the coordinating me mechanism for the colonies, right? Mm -hmm. He's there. And then when he stops doing his work, he says, we're left with nothing. We're left with chaos because there's no coordinating mechanism. Everything that collaborates has a coordinating mechanism. It must. If it defaults to just squabbles here and there, it will. But your body has a very complex brain and neural system to, to make sure that 35 trillion cells are coordinated every single minute of every single day. Mm -hmm. And that's what government does, is it has to figure out how to coordinate in our case, 350 some million people to coexist and have our systems coexist and have ability to move around on roads and have clean water. That's the role is to exist, you know, not just exist peacefully, which is great, but to exist at all, you know, mm -hmm. to make sure the food is safe and the airplanes are safe. That's what, that's what government is there to do is to serve people to live safely. Oh, I, I think that's excellent. I hadn't thought of it that way, but I like it. This is an interesting question. Can nature really provide a guide for a human to live together? Yes. Um, I think one of the things we've missed as we've, you know, when we as humans developed, we thought of, again, we're, we have these brains and we're thinking, right? Um, thinking, thinking, you know, how did the sun come across? You know, how does the sun rise every day? Why does it get cold? Why does it get hot? Why are there animals trying to eat us? All kinds of things, right? And then slowly people are like, well, why does this work this way? We have, a, you know, millions of smart people over the ages have developed all of these scientific theories and they've developed all of them. We're just, you know, tons of scientific theories, but we haven't always put them together. 
And in, in, it's only been in the last hundred years when DNA was discovered and how our science is discovered and how it all really works together that now we have the sort of sense of, oh, we can use those ideas to develop um, better systems, better human systems. For instance, the major thing that the major tool your body uses to make sure all your cells work together is a little thing called disclosure. Every one of your cells has to send a message up to the brain to say, here's all the information about me and how I'm doing. And if you're good, the brain just sort of passes you by. But if you're bad, let's say, let's say you sprained your ankle, you know, yeah. then the, um, then, then, you know, there's things that say, uh oh, you know, I, I just spilled cell contents all over my ankle neighborhood. Oh no, the brain comes up and says, okay, we'll take care of this. We'll send out some phagocytes and we'll send out these guys and we'll fix your ankle so that you're going to be all better and you minimize harm to other people. Well, those are things that, you know, we have done. We have an army, we have police that kind of keep us safe, right? Those, those things work. But that disclosure rule we could use that far better today than, than because information is so cheap. We could have companies um, report up to the government to say, this is how much we pollute. Yeah, it's an expense for the company to do that. But if you know that, the government can come in and say, oh, you're a big polluter, let's come in and help you. Rather than the company's trying to hide it and the government's chasing it, we spend a lot of money chasing these things to find out what's going on. Why don't we just disclose it and say, "Hey, we'll help you solve this problem. We'll pry, we'll give, we'll send you experts, or we'll pay for this, or we'll do that." And then what do we get? We get clean water on one side, and we get companies that that trust their government and are like, "Okay, we can coexist here. We can. We know that we're not going to get in trouble if we tell them what's going on." So it's a completely different way of coordinating that nature does really well, and we don't do well at all. So that's just mm -hmm. an example. Okay, I understand that. I think it's a uh, very valid point that uh, if the government or if the people tell the government, this is what I'm doing, it's kind of like you were saying, I think it's an excellent idea. I, I like it. Uh, well, and it, it's only for those things that could harm people. You don't have to say to the government, hey, I want to brush my teeth today, you hoo you know, but you do have no. to say, if you're a company that is making a complex product that might pollute things there let's get our heads together and decide figure out ways not to do that to produce your products and not pollute it's for those important problems that harm people not for well, everything no i i kind of thought that was the case you know what you know i'm gonna brush my teeth today you don't need to report that <laughs> but i'm gonna go create a product right to harm other people right 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 got it got it Is there really one idea that all people can agree on? Well, I think there is. And like I said, the trick is not just the idea, which is maximize choice and minimize harm. That's the idea. But how to do that, we have to use some of nature's tricks to do it. Adjust them for the human choice, right? Um, mm -hmm. Like I said, we don't have to disclose, a cell has to disclose all its information up to the brain because it doesn't have any ability to discern what's good or bad. But a human and the government do, do. So we can say, here's the things we want you to disclose, things that are important to other people's safety. And so we can learn, but we have to adjust it for the fact that humans are different. Um, but we can make much better systems. If we can look at like, um, I took, I use an example of social media and we could do social media a lot better by uh, providing this kind of information. Mm -hmm. um, so if you want, I can explain that. It's a little bit complicated, but I can explain it. <laughs> what do you think? I think you need to. What's that? I would, would not mind hearing that at all. Uh... Okay. Okay. So social media, the problem with social media is that People can post, I mean, there's a gazillion people who can post and a gazillion people who can post anything they want, right? right? And the problem is some of the posts are completely harmless and some of the posts are actually harmful, right? If you post that, you know, somebody should be murdered, that's a, that's a harmful post, right? We don't want that out there. But the problem is you have one activity. It's the same activity that's either harmful or benign. So how do you sort that out? 
Well, if it were in the body, so the first thing I always do is I look at how would the body do this? And the body would go up and say, hey, you know, you send the post up to the to the brain and the brain says, you can't do anything harmful. Get out of here, you know, and but but we aren't like that and we don't have that system. So instead, what you do is you put it back on the people and say, look, person, if you're going to post, you need you get to post what you want because we want to maximize your choice. But you're going to have to tag your posts with some accountability. So what you're going to do is you're going to have to say this post is a true thing or it's an opinion, not true by definition. And you have to take responsibility for posting it. So if I say, oh, I have the cutest dog in the world, I have to post that it's an opinion and I fully acknowledge that I'm posting this, right? Now let's say I post, you know, um, uh, my neighbor needs to be run over by a car because I don't like my neighbor. So I have to say, whoa, that's an opinion. That's not true. And I fully acknowledge it. And well, that's a kind of a bad example. Maybe let me give a better example. Let's say, oh, how about this one? The election was rigged. You know, that's that's not true. It's an opinion. And you can say your opinion, but you have to say, I fully acknowledge that I'm stating this as an opinion. All the evidence shows us that the election was not rigged. Every court case, everything, it's not rigged. So if you're going to say it, that's fine. You get to say it because you're a human, but it's an opinion and it has to be, you have to be tagged with the accountability. If you say it's true, everybody can argue with you and say, nope, all the truth is on the other side. And then the social media uh, company can say, you know what? Look, you gotta tag it accurately or you're out of the social media world. So that's my, that's my initial idea. I don't know if it's, it, it, it has to balance the human choice with the accountability that nature has all over the place. You're always accountable for what you do. Well, let's insert some more accountability into the social media system. I like that very, very well. Good. That, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Because we'll, the video is frozen for some reason. Okay. There we go. We, we got it back. Uh, okay. I like that a lot because we need accountability. I've, I've thought that for years that we need to be accountable for our actions and the mm -hmm. actions of other people. Right. Right. And humans, of course, accountability is hard. So humans like to avoid accountability whenever possible. Yep. Uh, but at times, if it's going to cause harm, accountability needs to be injected back into the system. And that's the job of your government where, where we can harm each other is to put in those stops while, while still maximizing what people can do and mm -hmm. still, and still, uh, not letting them harm each other. Yeah, that I think is the basic thing that you're trying to get across is don't harm. Yes. What, are the, yes. what does the doctor say? First, do no harm. Or something right, like Hippocrates. That? Yeah, he's on my wall back here. Okay. <laughs> uh, First, do no harm. <laughs> right. I think that's if we could just get that message across, we wouldn't need a whole lot of the laws we have. Right, right. And it's so much easier to figure out what laws to have. That's the point of my book. And uh, when my book comes out, uh, it's coming out in November. Um, okay. That is the the real point of the book is to is to is to kind of give all the background so you can see what it is. But in the end, it's one sentence. People get to do what they want as long as they don't harm others is the one sentence I want people to take away. Yeah, I'm going to put that so if I can fit it across, when I probably when I get ready to edit this, I usually put the website above, above the person's head right up here. Yes. And uh, I want to put that there. If I could fit that in there. What was that? What quote? It's like, it's quote, like, what is it? Say? Oh, um, that humans can do whatever they want as long as they don't harm others. That's the major idea. You don't even have to read the book. I mean, if, if you just live that idea, I'm happy. You don't have to buy the book, but the book just sort of explains it as kind of, duh, this is a logical extension of everything that's ever existed in the in the world. I don't think that's going to fit, but I'll get it in the show notes too. If I record my show notes as well, as put them in writing. Okay, great.
you, they have to do the show and also even though they may not because it comes on before you do when the when I set up the editing. One okay. The, before the main interview, I've got the show notes so that they got a concept of what's going on. It's brief, okay. usually about a minute, minute and a half. Okay. But there it is. And I'll put your website above your head. Oh, great. What's the name of the book? The book is called The Human Idea, Nature's Newest Ecosystem. Okay. I gotta take notes off again. It might really no worries. Work. I appreciate that. Yeah, I like to quote it accurately because I want to be quoted accurately. And sure. I like to quote other people accurately. What one idea can people really agree on? I just got an idea of what you want to say. Say it anyway. There it is again. There, you know. I guess I really wanted to make that point with my with my questions. Uh, but yeah, this is, I think that everyone in the world, this is my hope at least, that everybody in the world could agree with this concept that they would like to do whatever they can as long as they don't harm each other. And I just think that everybody would go, yeah, duh, that, that makes sense. I could, I could live with that. And that should be the base of all of our coordinating systems. Mm -hmm. That should be the base. They might look different but if you have that as the base, like, it's just like your body, you know, you look different than a tiger. The tiger has 300 trillion cells and, but they, you work very much the same way. Um, mm -hmm. So they've implemented the, you know, the do no harm, uh, you know, mechanism differently than you. And I think societies can do that. There can be different flavors of societies and cultures, but if everybody agreed on the do no harm concept, and the maximized choice concept, wouldn't the world be a better place? And oh. that's that's what I want to make. That's what I'm trying to have people consider. Yeah. What is truth? <laughs> I, you know, I just finished reading a, a nice bunch of philosophy books and I'm like, geez, I just treated this so much more pragmatically. But truth is something that's provably true. Um, it can be repeated, reliably, provably true, like two plus two equals four. Nowhere in the world can two plus two equal anything but four. Um, and, you know, everything else, except for maybe math and science, is, is not true. And it doesn't mean it's bad or unvaluable. Um, art is an opinion, <laughs> you know, once you make it, it's a true thing, but, but like um, um, opinions are not true. I, I can say, you know, my dog is the cutest dog ever. It's okay. It's good to be put out there and considered, but it's not true. You know, it's an opinion and opinions are fine. You know, fiction, not true, but we give people a lot of information, a lot of stuff to consider so that that then those I ideas then move them to think of new ideas and to create the world in a better place. So opinions are a non-truth. Um, lies are another non-truth. And lies are really interesting because they're provably false, right? I mean, it's the opposite of truth is a lie. If you mm -hmm. say, you know, my dog is a cat, it's not true. You can't have both of those things be true. So, and it's provably false. Everybody can see that it's false. So mm -hmm. that's the difference between a lie and an opinion. Um, and then there's things like theories. Theories are true, but they're not so irrefutably true, like two plus two equals four, that people try to treat them as optional, like the theory of evolution. Every, every fact that has been uncovered supports the theory of evolution. There's never been uh, a fact that doesn't support evolution, but we don't have a complete fossil record. So you can't say, you know, how a fish turned into a human or something. You know, you can't because the fossil record isn't complete. So people are like, well, that can't be true. But it's like every fact we have is true. So those are kind of where theories go. And my theory of idea, the idea sphere is a theory because nobody can measure the ideas that come out of a brain. You can't measure them. They're, they're, they're electronic signals that get put together. We can't measure that. So 
it's a theory. You know, I think it makes sense. It comports with all the facts, but it's a theory. Okay. And then the last one is things that are beliefs, things that cannot be proven or disproven. And this is sort of where religion comes into that category where somebody says there's a God. It's like, well, you can't actually prove there's a God, but you can't disprove there's a God. So that's based on faith. Everybody says, well, you got to have faith. You got to believe in something that you can't see or hear or taste or scent. And that's, people do that. But mm -hmm. it's a, it's another it's another part of what I would consider non-truth for this very pragmatic reason of living on this earth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, faith is a nebulous kind of thing, in my opinion. I'm very faithful. I, I, I'm very spiritual. And I read somewhere a few years ago that humans are hardwired for religion. I read that too. Yeah. So, and well, and I would say that humans like to think. And I think what humans did early on is say, you know, why are we here? What could possibly be? And they did acknowledge that they were very different from other animals. So the fact that you would um, would think of a God as somebody who created you makes all kinds of sense. It's just mm -hmm. as we've learned more, it it I think religion moves more into a personal spiritual realm as opposed to a factual realm. And I think there's a lot of room for morality for people saying, oh, I I like the ideas that I, you know, these help me live my life or whatever. But it gets further and further away from what it was really an early science to more of a belief system, which is, you know, belief systems are ideas. And that's fine. Okay. I see what you say. It's really very good. You use nature as a guide to describe a cue for the negative aspect of social media. No, oh, that's what we talked about, social media. And we've already talked about that one, so we don't need to go there. What is the biggest difference, do you think, is between humans and other life forms other than we can think? Right, it is. Choice. I call the choice the, sum the human superpower. Uh, because what happens is with animals is, like I said, when they are born, they are fully functional uh, beings in their realm. You know, the parents might have to help them learn to walk or they might protect them a little bit, but basically they're fully functional. Humans, we are born with no ideas. And that means that we have to spend a huge amount of time throwing these ideas into people. And then once we get the ideas, we choose between them. We get to choose the actions between the, all the ideas that are presented. You know, when I was a kid, I, you know, I went to high school, I learned all kinds of things. And then I went to college and I chose one of them and I became an accountant, believe it or not, you know? So, um, you know, you, you make your choices from a vast array of choices. And the more information you put into young people, hopefully the better choices they make when they're when they're older. And that's where the importance of education is. It's really critical. We start with zero ideas. If a society is going to peacefully coexist, we should do a really good job of educating people, not just on reading and writing and arithmetic, which are great, but also what's the purpose of our, you know, uh, of, of, of humans as far as how do we coexist? What really is harm? How do we manage to optimize our choices and minimize harm? What if people disagree with us? What do we do? Those are all things we could teach our young people to get them ready to live in the idea sphere. I so absolutely I agree. I totally agree with that 100%. And we're yeah. not doing a good job of educating our children. And I think that's because we don't really understand um, I, I, like I said, I think we don't understand this fundamental idea very well. And if we did, we'd be like, oh, of course, education is the key to everything. If you know you're born, our child or our children are born without ideas, wouldn't we want to put the very best ideas into them? But we don't even really get that concept. And that's why I think this whole, the, the theory is a little bit new. It twists the facts on their head a little bit and, and puts them kind of in a arrangement that we can understand that makes sense. And you can say, oh, yeah, I guess we really should teach children, you know, more importantly, you know, more, give them more than just uh, this limited view of what education is. And, mm -hmm. you know, um, 
I think that's really, really important because the other thing that's really different between humans is that we do create, I, um, we create stuff with our ideas. We are the only people that can put information outside our bodies and then it has a life of its own. Except for like, a, you know, like I said, a bird builds a nest or a bee builds a hive. We can create things that last millions of years. In fact, Origin of Species by Charles Darwin was written in 1859, one of my favorite books. And mm -hmm. I used it as a source in 2024. That yeah. thing, that because he sat down and put the information outside of his head into a book form that has been maintained for hundreds of years, I can use it to create a new theory today. Yeah, That's and, what humans can do that no one else can do. No, uh, humans are a unique species. This is off the wall question that hasn't had a lot to do with it. Are we the only species on the, in the universe? Oh, I don't think so. I, I don't know, obviously. But, you know, the way I look at it is, you know, I spend a little time at the beginning of my book talking about the universe and the Big Bang and energy. And what happens is, you know, with time, energy changes. And when you think about it, another way to look at humans and the Earth is we're just energy. We're just energy put into matter, which is a very uh, efficient form for storing energy right and then we took that matter and made it into life forms that can that can pro, uh, you know procreate over time to keep a species alive for a long time but we're just energy when it comes right down to it mm -hmm. and energy moves that's all it does so if if in one part of the universe that kind of all started the same way and it took a long time you know for some billion years for the earth to or i'm sorry eight almost 9 billion years for the earth to form Mm -hmm. then my guess is that there's out there, the energy's moving in similar ways all over. And what I would say is there are life forms that, but they don't look just like us. I no. mean, they could be based on, we're kind of based on carbon. They could be based on methane or, or oxygen or, you know, I don't know, gold, who knows, you know, it just depends on how, but uh, I, my son-in-law is a, is a geochemist, at uh, um, Livermore Labs, and he gets to work on the the Bennu uh, asteroid, you mm -hmm. know that came that we just that just came back. He gets to work yeah. on that thing because he's a real smart kid. Yeah, um, but he is, yeah, but he has said, well, we found amino acids in the asteroid, and so that those are the building blocks of life. Yeah, it takes a long time and it needs a lot of different conditions to make it work. And the earth, uh, you know, is, is got everything that happened on the earth allowed a life form like us to exist. We fit the conditions of the earth. I think there's places all over that beings can procreate that because the, 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 the science works the same way everywhere generally. Yeah. And, and so my guess is obviously, I would say just my opinion, obviously there's life everywhere. We, but it's just the universe is huge and it's far, far away. And, you know, it may yeah, not be at the same time concurrently, but I would say absolutely. Yeah, I tend to agree with that statement. I'm very, very uh, aware that the human, the universe is large and is really unique. Mm -hmm. But I don't think we're terminally unique. Right, right. So I agree with you. We're about out of time here, Anne. Okay. So is there anything you need to say? Well, uh, first of all, I want to say thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about my book and to talk about these ideas. More importantly, I think um, the most important thing that I have found from living my, even living my life this way, where I can look around at people, I'm like, ah. Eh, that doesn't hurt anybody. I can let a lot of stuff roll off. <laughs> and the stuff really, I think overall, people are really not harmful. They're really, I don't want to say good and bad because that's not what I really mean, but I mean that people live their lives um, coexisting really well. And mm -hmm. if we, we could add this idea, it's really easy to distinguish where when somebody is harming somebody, you can come up and say, hey, you know, you can intervene, but most of the time people are really harmless, you know? Yeah. And so we could 
it's it's like a it's an easy way to live life this way and i can look at a lot of times you know i've kind of looked at this idea with homelessness or like police violence or you know uh, prostitution there's lots of problems we can look at um in the today and and look at them with this sort of technique and we can change the way i think it would change the way we would deal with them and I think that's what I'm really looking for people to do, because a lot of people are out there who are experts in their field. If they, they apply their expertise with this idea in mind, I think we could come up with some fantastic solutions to make the world a better place. I have to agree with you based on everything that you've said and what I like. And, and, and uh, uh, you're both coming out in November. Yep. November 19th is our, our date right now. So I'm All hoping right. that, that will stay. I got to do a little work between there and now, but. <laughs> I'm sure you do. I just want to make sure I get it in there. In my show okay. because It's important. That we get yeah. this information out. I think Thank it's you. a great, great concept. You've done a lot of marvelous work. Thank um, you. Excuse me. I'm glad to have you on board. And. About six months, I may contact you again, if I may. Sure, absolutely. I would love to talk anytime. And we'll, see how, and we'll yeah. see how your book's doing. Okay. Well, if people are interested, I also wrote a fictional version of this same book. Um, and it's called Dina, uh, Nature's Case for Democracy. And it's more of a Socratic dialogue between two characters but it has a kind of a story and a lot of really bad puns because I love humor. Um, mm -hmm. But it's it's on Amazon, and if people want to read that, it's the same. It's a it's a richer discussion of what my new book will be, but mm -hmm. it's also a little bit harder to read because there's a story and there's the concepts and they go back and forth. And uh, but this new book is going to be straight up just the nonfiction. Here's the story. I have a little humor, but you don't get as much when you're writing nonfiction. Yeah. But, no, you don't. but the fictional version is is a lot was a lot of fun for me to write. Uh, I bet it was. I uh, no, I'm a writer, but not that good. No. Oh. <laughs> well, I loved I loved writing that book. It was a labor of love for me. Well, uh, I'm and this, of that. And I'll, yeah, I'll and this up. theory I've been working on, like I said, for thirty odd years, and thinking about it for another twenty. So it it was. I felt like ah. I, I did the thing that I wanted to do, what I wanted to put out in the world. Yeah, I did. And you did a good job of it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. And for being here, I appreciate it. And this will not be, well, don't leave. I'm just going to stop the recording. Okay. Thank you. I really appreciate it. You bet. Thank you for listening to the show. There are show notes and a place to comment at https colon forward slash forward slash coffee dash time dash again dot lips and dot com forward slash website. He hopes that you liked what you heard and will tell others about him. Dale is attempting to get a following that both disagrees and agrees with him. He does not want yes men. If you disagree, wonderful. He is happy to have you here as a part of the coffee time again team. Dale does not talk about the news of the day. He is attempting to give a history lesson that is just as important about what is going on in the headlines of today. Please do not hesitate to contact him. Just remember that Dale wants a clean show, meaning no cussing, name calling, yelling, or hate aloud. You can disagree with him and not be disagreeable about it. Support him and keep help keep this alive. HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash glow dot fm forward slash coffee dash time and dash again.